thing holds true for cities everywhere. Hello, uh, I'm Arch Booth, the executive vice president of the National Chamber, an organization which is deeply and vitally interested uh, in your problems. We recognize the problems that your community faces, and we know that you share them with hundreds of cities everywhere. Basically, of course, you want to make your city a better place in which to live because that's where your families, your friends, and your neighbors work and live. Now, what's involved in making your city a better place? Well, things like housing, industrial development, better streets and highways with special emphasis on parking and traffic conditions, of course, better schools and playgrounds and parks, a host of public facilities and services. Improving all these things adds up to a better town, a better city. Now, I'd like to have you meet uh, two men who are thoroughly acquainted with the problems your city faces. They understand the trends and forces that created your problems, and they're developing ways to help you solve them. This is Fred Bashaw, an outstanding and respected real estate consultant. He has put together on film the story of the dynamic American city. It's an important and impressive story. It has meaning for you and your city. And this is Jim Steiner, the manager of the National Chamber's uh, Construction and Civic Development Department. He and his staff are working every day on ways to meet the task of improving your city. Now, Fred, this motion picture shows graphically the trends and forces working constantly in all our towns and cities, does it not? Yes, I think it does. I'm sure that you will see the exciting opportunity that exists for your city to become better. And you will see patterns and trends in this film which are mirrored in your own town or city. Perhaps most importantly, you will see the need for understanding and organization to do the vital job of making your city better for the people who are your city. This matter of getting people to work together to make their city better is something that Jim Steiner has given a lot of thought and attention to. Jim, uh, you and your staff have been working out ways to help meet the needs of our dynamic American cities, have you not? We have. And the result of a great deal of research and experience has been compressed into this booklet, our Urban Development Guidebook. That's just what it is, by the way, a guidebook for you. Here are suggestions for organizing your manpower to do the job with emphasis on the fact that it is your job, it's a local job. This booklet is a good stepping off point to meet the problems you face in your town or city. I mention it now so that you'll know these problems can be met. There are proven ways to make your city better. Why not have your chamber secure a copy of the Urban Development Guidebook from the National Chamber of Commerce, Washington, D.C.? Thank you, Jim. Thank you, too, Fred Bashaw. I think now we're ready to have you tell us about the challenge of the dynamic American city. there stands an impressive statue of Columbus, a reminder that this is a new continent in the light of history. America not so long ago was a continent of wilderness and open space. Excitement stirred in the hearts of a multitude of men as eyes turned toward the challenge of a new land. Now America is a land of mighty cities, and much of our space has been transformed into urban density. We see this on the East Coast in a city like Boston. And we see the same density on the West Coast in a city like San Francisco. Practically all American cities, large and small, have a similar pattern of density. As we look closely, we see that city lots are narrow. Here is a 24-foot lot. The average city lot is 20 feet, laid out on straight streets in a gridiron pattern. It is not uncommon to find miles of 16 and a half foot lots. And so we observe that the American city is a development of narrow lots. This is the first point. The American city is dense, with a narrow lot pattern. 
Actually, we can often find lots as narrow as 12 and a half feet. In observing the narrow lot pattern of our cities, it is important to recognize that all classes of property are included. The word density has so long been associated with slums that we have forgotten in America the important truth that all city people have lived in the narrow lot pattern, including the well-to-do. Many of our finest city homes are to be found on narrow lots. The second point to consider is that density was a way of life for all people and included every type of residential property. A question of importance, therefore, is why did all city dwellers adjust their lives to narrow lots? The reason becomes apparent as we see our city stables. This attractive structure was built to shelter horses. Many stables still remain in our cities. These are now converted into much sought after apartments. Not long ago, however, horses were moving in and out of this courtyard. If we are alert, we can often see a vestige of the horse and buggy era, like the hitching post. Indeed, we occasionally see old Dobbin himself. It is of the utmost importance for us to remember that throughout most of the history of civilization, man has been dependent upon animals for transportation. This then is the basic cause of urban density and the third important point, man built densely because of his reliance on horses. Having built densely on narrow lots, we created many interesting and peculiar properties. Here is a high-rise apartment house on a 22-foot lot. Rising on a horse and buggy lot, such a structure is an interesting illustration of the problem of narrow lot use. In another view, we can see a peculiar situation surrounding a city residence. This home is 20 feet wide, a common city size. And as we look above and to the sky, we see what might well be described as a fine light and air shaft for the abutting properties. Nevertheless, this type of land improvement is far from ideal in terms of land use. Again, however, it reflects the continuing influence of the horse and buggy plan. To illustrate the opposite extreme, we view a 20-foot residence rising above its abutting structures. Such a scene suggests, too, the steady pulse of urban change, a residence now completely surrounded by industry. An extremely interesting observation is to be found at Radio City, the world's largest commercial development. As we look to the ground, we see a typical horse and buggy lot still remaining on one of the busy Radio City corners. Thus we see that the narrow lot pattern tends to endure and can exert its influence on the mightiest of our commercial developments. Indeed, the density of all real estate, wherever it exists, stems directly from the primitive horse and buggy plan and skyscrapers themselves are no exception. The American city has been amazingly dynamic despite powerful built-in limitations on land use. Meanwhile, forces arose that brought stimulating competition in land use. The first impact was the generation and control of energy with the steam engine. What a revolutionary power the steam engine brought. The steam engine made possible for the first time in history a release from the bondage of density. The commuter trains began to move from our cities as people began to respond to the allurement of open space. Out into the country the trains traveled as man found a new freedom in land use. A revolution in land use had begun. Sometime after the steam engine, the trolley car made its appearance. And here again was a revolutionary impact on city life. From almost every American community, the trolley car widened the horizon and moved out into rural space. We have all but forgotten the rural trolleys with their quaint station stops. We should not forget their influence on land use. We still have and urgently need rapid transit, but the old time trolley has all but passed with the horse. Finally came the staggering impulse of mass transportation, the motorization of our economy. So new, so powerful, so revolutionary is this force 
that we have hardly been able to appraise its influence. Moreover, its impact has struck every American community. Americans have been thrown into a state of amazing mobility with freeways for automobiles and buses crisscrossing in all directions. Not only autos and buses, but also fast-moving trucks have brought complete motorization. Mass transportation has accelerated decentralization of cities everywhere, and the rush to outlying areas has often been so great that the congestion of the highway has become as bothersome as the congestion of the city. Along with the motorization of our economy came full electrification, a powerful complementary force that completed the revolution in land use. Now we were able to generate and send power all over the continent, resulting in a profusion of mechanical servants for our homes and industries. Together, the automobile and electricity have combined to put the entire continent into an amazing state of competitive change. Many of our farms in America are no longer rural and remote. Bulldozers have been active. Streets are crisscrossing our open farm lands. Electric wires are bringing the convenience of electrical equipment everywhere. And new homes are now measured in high-level production figures. Millions of acres have been taken over for housing as a result of explosive expansion and spillover from our cities. This movement has been so general that it might well be said that the frontier has come back to every American community. Outlying residential growth has been so great that large stores have followed. Everywhere, business properties have responded to residential impetus and the movement of automobiles. The commitments that have been made have often been highly substantial, indicating strong confidence in the strength of shopping power in new suburban areas. Thus, we have seen the rural mailbox, where land might have been worth $500 or less per acre, now worth $50,000 or more per acre with the announcement of a new shopping center, made possible solely by the passing of automobiles that have brought a value never before possible. It's startling how rapidly our leading chain stores have been settling in open rural space. Land recently a desert can now support a new hotel because of automobiles. It is not uncommon to see a steady trend of office building construction on our highways. Actually, some of our office buildings are going into really remote settings. Such a location is truly revolutionary for office use and possible only because of the automobile. It is a dramatic illustration of the allurement of open space. And attractiveness is a keynote of many new outlying office buildings. Space and visual appeal are highly competitive with outmoded downtown areas. Even industrial plants are taking on a new look. The most powerful competitive force of all is the new shopping center with its landscaped mall. Some are park-like, beautiful, restful. In this respect, new shopping centers have accented the problem of built-in downtown obsolescence. Surely the most competitive force of new shopping centers is abundant space for free parking at the very door of outlying stores. Open space is such a competitive power, with acres for parking and room, too, for trees and shrubs. There is no denying the competitive strength of new outlying business areas. Let us see now if the city has remained dynamic in the face of powerful competitive forces. We do not have to look far to know that it has. New buildings are continually changing city skylines. In city after city, we can observe the framework of substantial new structures against the narrow horse and buggy properties. The contrast of 1880 and the present is becoming a common sight. The problems of our cities are real, however, because of the heavy hand of old-fashioned design. It affects residential property. Much of our industrial space presents a special problem with old multi-story buildings. The elaborate pigeon roost we see here suggests that obsolescent stocks are apartment properties. Substantial and ornate buildings are to be found everywhere. Surely obsolescence should not cause despair. It is one of the results of America's rapid growth. It is the basic challenge to cities, however, 
and a two-fold problem, architectural obsolescence and narrow lot pattern. The truly dynamic American cities are those that are coming to grips with the problem of outmoded structures. Increasingly, we are seeing large-scale demolition as the first step in building modern cities. The need of the hour is to acquire pottage by merging narrow lots for a new start. Getting needed space in our cities for modern structures is the only way to meet the competitive force of growing suburban strength. Some of our demolition is an easy process because of much light wood construction. Often the substance of our urban structures is such as to resist the power of the demolition hammer. As a people, however, we are steadfast as we tackle problems and the hammer of demolition will be sure to swing with determination. In this jet age, events move fast, faster indeed than we sometimes realize. And our progress is certain to be steady as we clear away the structures that block progress. Obsolescence runs through all types of property, including some of our finest mansion homes. These too will bow to demolition, and as they pass from the American scene, strategic land will be cleared for new use. To be fully dynamic, the American city must now accommodate the automobile. This is the vital factor of our new age. The poor little parking meter is not by itself a solution to automobile problems. The forward-looking city is conscious of the automobile and automobile traffic as key factors. It is responding by providing adequate, well-located parking facilities, often building skyward to create the urgently needed space. Many cities have melted the problem by building underground. We are applying full ingenuity to the task and with good results. Here we see self-parking. Self-parking is accomplished in the San Francisco downtown garage by an ingenious use of concentric ramps, making it possible for the motorist to park and remove his own car. Reduced operating expenses result in low rates, $15 per month being very low for a large city. Also, there is free parking under a validation stamp plan with cooperating merchants. Hotels are striving to provide for automobile registry and even attached garage storage. The El Cortez Hotel of San Diego, alert to the automobile, constructed a motel right across the street so that now it offers both hotel and motel accommodations. A clever plan was worked out in the downtown store area of Salt Lake City. Here a minimum of valuable business frontage was used for entering and leaving a parking garage. This is ingenious. This plan puts the garage in the rear on less valuable land. How vital such pottage can be. Space is a vital need too for new downtown stores. See the power of adequate commercial land. Here a full block in downtown Salem, Oregon is devoted to a new and attractive Meyer and Frank store. What centralizing strength can flow from such a constructive development? And there is even an attached garage for the automobile age. In the last analysis, the city cannot be dynamic without adequate residential accommodations. Land for residential use is a most urgent need. In Kansas City, astute private enterprise has made real achievement in residential construction on Quality Hill near downtown. It is imperative that we think of the city as a way of life with fundamental accent on residential properties. In this view, we must be continually combating residential deterioration. Property owners must be vigorously encouraged to fix up. Even the most modest homes will present an attractive and harmonious appearance if properly maintained. We have the problem, therefore, of code enforcement. Standards must be set and maintained because the deterioration of one property can adversely affect others. Every possible help must be given to those who seek to live well in our cities. They should be considered as preferred city residents entitled to full residential enjoyment. American ingenuity is also being displayed in residential property. Here is a cooperative apartment house 
on a narrow 30 foot by 60 foot lot. Each floor is offered for sale as a separate residence. Thus, an owner acquires a ranch house, so to speak, in a convenient downtown location. The concept of cooperative ownership has been growing and will no doubt be greatly expanded during the years ahead. The city, therefore, clearly remains dynamic under the force of constant change. The pulse of progress is steady. Some properties are rushing into existence and others are rushing into discard. Alert eyes know it is inevitable that properties like these must go. It is not surprising, therefore, to return and see their removal underway. In America, we should not be impatient. All problems cannot be tackled at once. It is also new that we have hardly had time to remove the cobblestones from some of our city streets. Indeed, if you can remember the Model T, you have lived since most of the revolutionary changes in real estate. And as we go steadily forward, we see aluminum skyscrapers and stainless steel. The introduction of metals in real estate itself is revolutionary. It is difficult to believe that America is a land only recently removed from the log cabin, from primitive shelter. It is good that the state of Oregon has placed a statue of the pioneer woodsman on its capital, a beautiful reminder that the wilderness of this land was reduced to a dynamic civilization with the simple ax. What amazing achievement there has been in America. The problems of rapid growth are real but not insurmountable. Surely we must never construe density as a deterrent to city life. In many dramatic ways we are moving in on obsolescence. We see in this setting new apartments introducing a new life. And note the proximity to office buildings, an exciting new city trend. Beauty in commercial architecture is another new revolutionary force helping our cities. Frequently we find deep setback with trees. The introduction of attractiveness in commercial real estate results in a new harmony between commercial and residential. This is revolutionary because in the past, business property was often considered repugnant. Surely the pleasing harmony here is a constructive force for good in building modern cities. Let us summarize now by looking at St. Louis. First, what is St. Louis? Well, in terms of urban problems, it means broad leadership, chamber of commerce, architects, city planners, realtors, home builders, contractors, mortgage lenders, government officials. In short, a cross-section of community leaders must unite for action. The first step, of course, is urgently needed plottage. That has been started in St. Louis. In the use of the cleared land, St. Louis has made a highly desirable step in having an apartment house as an initial structure. Its close proximity to downtown office buildings gives accent to the exciting current trend toward living close in. The comforts, convenience, and even the health of living in a small world are being recognized by increasing numbers of people. Many people are desiring to walk to work again. Such stimulating activity sparks further effort, and St. Louis is now cleaning up existing buildings to tone up the entire downtown area. The apartments, however, are the most significant because there can be no enduring city vitality unless we provide for full city life. Lest you conclude that we are considering only large cities, let's look at very small ones. Here are some quaint obsolescence in tiny Columbus, Indiana common, of course, to cities large and small. Leadership in Columbus refused to despair about obsolescence. A renowned architect was retained to create new beauty. The results are inspirational. What a great contribution our design professions are making and can continue to make in our urban life. Constructive activity was extended into the downtown business area. Here we see a typical American business street as developed during the horse and buggy era. A civic-minded family of bankers decided to construct a new bank using the finest of architectural guidance. The result, a breath of new life on an obsolete street. A truly beautiful corner with contemporary style, deep setback, and trees.
It is really a great contribution to community betterment. People are well served. The problems of the automobile were fully realized and planned for with the very latest in drive-in facilities. The contrast of the old and a refreshing new achievement suggest that the pulse of healthy change exists also in small communities. Another exciting observation is found in the small community of Bartlesville, Oklahoma, the now famous Price Tower by Frank Lloyd Wright. For a small town, this building is quite amazing because it has offices and apartments on the same floor. Many people are putting strong accent on convenience even in small communities. Here certainly is another contribution of greatness and in a small city. Moreover, it is a law of real estate that constructive, dynamic effort sparks other activity. It is not surprising, therefore, to find collateral work going on in the area around the tower. Further demolition and rebuilding are stimulated by every constructive achievement. Thus, the benefits spread. The story, moreover, is the same for any community, large or small. Exciting change is going on everywhere. Here, for example, is the tallest building in America to be demolished to start over. Surely we shall not demolish all our large buildings, but the lesson is clear. We live in a day of bold planning. From now on, we shall be seeing much demolition, the first step in making our cities better places to work, better places to live. It will take great effort and real leadership, but as a people, we can do the jobs. And as we see here the rubble of demolition at the feet of Columbus, let us remember that in many ways the continent is still before us. Our follow-up at this point shows Columbus standing in majestic survey of the most important dynamic urban trend, the office building and the apartment building going hand in hand to demonstrate the convenience of city life. And so the city remains dynamic. Surely, if we can recapture the courage and forward-looking spirit of the discoverers and pioneers of America, building better cities will be assured. can see. This is my Kung Fu, and it is strong. See you later!